The year is 1272. The assassin from the School of the Viper has shown his hand, and by his deeds, the Nordlings are weaker than they have ever been. From another dimension, an ashen-haired princess returns to her native world, pursued both by spectral riders and her white wolf of destiny. While all this happens, black banners crest over the Yoruga River, heralding the beginning of the final showdown between North and South. Welcome to our fourth and final video on the history of the Witcher universe. In this installment, we will cover the Third Nilfgaardian War. In the world of the Witcher, getting better hair can be done with simple magic, but we mere humans have options too, thanks to our sponsor, Keeps. Keeps provides a subscription service that delivers clinically approved hair loss treatments right to your door, at half the cost of pharmacy prices. Two out of three men experience hair loss by the time they're 35, and mere sorcery won't be enough to stop it here in our world. Instead, Keeps will set you up with clinically backed treatments to prevent hair loss and encourage growth, with most users seeing results after six months. Plus, the treatment plan includes unlimited, round-the-clock messaging with on-staff medical professionals to tailor your own hair care system with personal recommendations. You can add their award-winning thickening shampoo and conditioner to help even further, and all of their products get refill reminders to make sure you're always good to go. Hair loss stops with Keeps. To get 50% off your first order, go to keeps.com slash wizardsandwarriors or click the link in the description. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash wizardsandwarriors. This land never flowed with milk and honey, but now it flows with blood. Ambassador Varakra After the disastrous summit of Loch Muin, the northern kingdoms were cannibalizing themselves. Temeria was without a king, held together only by the Herculean efforts of its resident war hero John Natalis. Cagewen was humiliated and impoverished after King Henselt's defeat at the Siege of Vergen. Even for Aedern, victory had borne bitter fruit, for it had cost them Crown Prince Stennis, their best hope since the Kingslayers killed King Dermawend, and half their territory, as dragon rebel Saskia had carved out her own free state in the Pontar Valley. Redania, it seemed, was the only major Nordling realm in relatively good standing, and yet it also was the heartland of the Church of the Eternal Flame, whose violent persecution of mages throughout the north had been occurring since the Kingslayer Letho had successfully pinned the assassinations of Kings Foltest and Dermawend on the Lodge of Sorceresses. King Radovid, bitter and resentful from a childhood in which he had been dominated and puppeteered by the sorceress Philippa Eilhart, had become the grim face of this brutal persecution. While witch hunters tortured small town herbalists and scheming barons sought to tear apart their now kingless realms, no one thought to turn their gaze southwards. So it was that in the winter of 1271, a massive invasion force assembled at the behest of the white flame dancing on the barrows of his enemies. Emir Varem Reis had crossed his personal Rubicon, either the north would be his or the scheming nobles in his imperial court would do him in. Either way, the Third Nilfgaardian War was about to begin. The size of the Nilfgaardian expeditionary force is unclear, but given the precedent set by levies assembled during their first and second invasion attempts, a total figure ranging anywhere from 100,000 to 300,000 men seems likely. The expedition split into an eastern and western prong, the exact nature of these contingents' leadership is also obscured, but from the sources available to us, we can glean that one Peter Sarguin Leve spearheaded the Western Front, while Morvan Voorhees, commander of the Alba Division, took charge of the Eastern Offensive. In the initial weeks of the war, the Black Sun blitzkrieged rapidly into Nordling territory. In the east, Rivia fell quickly, and Queen Meave went into hiding. Next, Adern, kingless and divided, offered almost no resistance and was fully occupied within days. The non-humans and peasant folk of Saskia's free state, who only a year earlier had fought for their independence against Caedwin, put up fiercer resistance, but they too were conquered, although Saskia herself escaped the carnage, flying away in dragon form, her later fate unknown. In Temeria, 
John Natalis managed to rally what was left of the Temerian army and make his stand just north of the Uruga. For three days, the valiant Silver Lilies held the line against the Nilfgaardian advance, but on the third day they were crushed, the Zima fell, and Emperor Amir set up a temporary court in the erstwhile capital. Soon after, Sargwen Leve conquered the region of White Orchard. The largely lawless region of Velen was incorporated into the empire around the same time, after a battle that saw the Order of the Flaming Rose crushed and subsequently disbanded. Unwilling to dedicate the manpower and resources to controlling an ostensibly worthless swamp, Nilfgaardian Army Command delegated governance of Velen to a local native warlord, Philip Strenger, the so-called Bloody Baron. While all this was happening, the northernmost kingdom of Kavir maintained their long-standing neutrality pact with Nilfgaard, and while King Esterad had once turned the tide of battle in the Second Nilfgaardian War with his financial aid to his fellow Nordling realms, no such aid would be forthcoming from his son and successor Tancred. By now, the non-humans of the north were wary of involving themselves in human conflicts. After being sold out by Nilfgaard at the end of the last war, the Scoia'tael would not fight alongside the Empire en masse as they once had, but the tiny elven state of Dol Blathana, still led by the sorceress Enid, likely revived their erstwhile ties to Nilfgaard as the Empire advanced. Meanwhile, the dwarves of Mahakam largely stayed out of the conflict. They had fought alongside the Nordlings at Sodden and Brenner, only to continue suffering the systemic racism of the human masses. Thus the mountain passes of Mahakam were closed, and since Dorvan mines supplied the lion's share of the north's iron, both sides had to respect their neutrality. Within three weeks, Nilfgaard had conquered half the north, advancing all the way to the Pontar River. But winter was approaching, so the legions halted, and while they waited for the first snows, they also awaited letters of surrender from the kings of Caedwin and Redania. These, however, would not be forthcoming. Despite his pointlessly cruel purges, leading to open rumours of his slow descent into madness, Radovid wanted for neither ambition nor tactical genius. Taking advantage of the political chaos engulfing the rest of the north, the Redanian king partitioned the squabbling Hengfors League between himself and Tancred. With his military capability bolstered by this, the mad monarch raised the royal army, but the banner of the White Eagle did not march upon the Nilfgaardian garrisons, as everyone expected. Instead, it attacked Caedwin. Taken completely by surprise, King Henselt was only able to muster piecemeal resistance and was killed in the fighting. Thereafter, all of Caedwin's armies willingly absorbed themselves under the Redanian banner. Now, instead of facing a series of divided, weak enemies, the Empire faced a single, strong one. Pam Param, Pam Pam Param. Random guard outside Glory Gate, Spring 1272. For Nilfgaard, what had begun as a furious blitzkrieg had quickly ground down into a bitter stalemate. Imperial attempts to break Radovid's perimeter on the Eastern Front were fruitless, as the Redanian army pushed the Black Banners back in separate sieges at Ban Glean and Ard Carre albeit at the brutal cost of thousands of human lives, both military and civilian. Meanwhile in the west, the Temerians had taken a page out of the book of their erstwhile Scoia'tael enemies. Taking to the forests, they formed bands of partisans, fighting as guerrillas to disrupt Nilfgaardian patrols and supply convoys. These rebels were discreetly funded by Radovid's agents, and while Redania did not have the numbers to push directly into Nilfgaardian-occupied Velen, their support of the Temerian resistance also paralyzed the Nilfgaardian advance. It was clear by now that Radovid and Emir were at an impasse, locked in a stalemate in which neither side had the key to breaking. So it was that both monarchs turned their eyes upon that key, the free city of Novigrad. Situated right at the mouth of the Pontar, Novigrad was unique amongst Nordling settlements in that it was an independent city-state, unbeholden to any northern kings. Having leveraged its crucial position at the mouth of the Pontar River to become the north's centre for trade and commerce, the city was host to a huge sum of mercenaries, gold and ships, 
which at present were committed to neither side of the war. As it turned out, Radovid had gotten a head start currying influence over the city. Under the Redanian king's influence, Novigrad had come under the strict theocratic rule of Hierarch Hemelfart of the Church of the Eternal Flame, whose ruthless witch hunters occupied themselves with hunting and burning every mage hidden in the city. After the brutal persecutions of mages after Loch Muin, many alchemists and magic users fled to the free city, only to realize they had jumped out of the frying pan and into the fire. To avoid a brutal end, these magic refugees were forced to shelter within the city's criminal underworld, a cabal of brutal mafiosos, led unofficially by a certain former Redanian spymaster. Indeed, Sigismund Dijkstra had fallen far since falling out with King Radovid some time after the Peace of Sintra. The fortunes of Novigrad's arcane refugees soon turned when Triss Merigold, erstwhile heroine of Sodden Hill, was able to create an underground railroad aided by Dijkstra and also a certain white-haired witcher, because of course he would appear in this story sooner or later. Henceforth, most mages were secretly ferried out of Novigrad to Kavir, where King Tancred offered them unconditional sanctuary. Be they killed or escaped, the north, save Kavir of course, was now largely without any wizards, a caste which had historically made up the lion's share of their best, brightest and most educated. While all this was happening, a clandestine plot was brewing in the hinterlands outside Oxenfurt. Vernon Roach, former commander of the Blue Stripes and leader of the Temerian Partisans, in partnership with Tala, former head of Temerian Intelligence Services, had established contact with Dijkstra. Together they had pooled their resources to a single end, assassination. Not of Emir, as one might expect, but of Radovid. Ostensibly, the conspirators believed that the increasingly insane Radovid was unfit to lead the north. Therefore, under the just hand of a new monarch, Redania would be able to push back Nilfgaard and restore the old borders. In this, they were aided by the ubiquitous Geralt of Rivia, whose famous romantic escapades with the realm's sorceresses lended him a vested interest in making sure Radovid didn't kill all of them. Radovid, however, was no fool. The memory of the Witcher Kingslayers was fresh in his mind, and thus he had hauled himself up securely aboard his royal barge, docked securely in the ports of Oxenfurt. It would take a special type of bait to lure him out of his shell, and that bait came in the form of Philippa Eilhart. The former Redanian advisor had managed to escape Radovid's purges, but not before the king had her eyes cruelly gouged out. Thus, despite the lingering animosity between her and her former lover, Dijkstra, the sorceress inserted herself in the plot to kill the monarch who had wronged her. Using Philippa as bait, the conspirators lured Radovid off his barge and onto the winding streets of Novigrad's Temple Isle, for the king wanted to personally oversee the death of the woman who had tormented him throughout his childhood. This wrath would be his demise. Cornered by Roach's partisans, Radovid was confronted by his former advisor, who settled her score before ending the monarch's life. The assassins were successful, Redania was now without a king, but hardly had celebrations begun before the conspirators came to loggerheads with one another. As it turns out, the Temerian partisans had been in league with Nilfgaard the entire time, and in return for the assassination of Radovid and the cessation of guerrilla activities, the Emperor would grant Temeria internal autonomy as an ally and vassal state under the new imperial regime. Dijkstra, however, categorically opposed the sacrificing of the other northern realms for the questionable autonomy of one. He fully intended to seize the Redanian throne and unite the northern resistance movements under him in an organized effort to push back the Nilfgaardian advance. To that end, Dijkstra sought to eliminate Roach and Tala to prevent their deal with Nilfgaard from going through. This, however, would be thwarted by none other than the White Wolf, and sometime later, the Spymaster's body would be found in the Butcher's Yard Theatre in Novigrad. With both Radvid and Dijkstra now dead, the North was bereft of capable leaders. Temeria had supplicated themselves to the invaders, and the partisans who had once paralyzed the Imperial advance now supported their northwards march. 
the final act of the war was now to begin. Nilfgaard was free to march on Novigrad. Evil is evil. Lesser, greater, middling, makes no difference. The degree is arbitrary, the definitions blurred. If I'm to choose between one evil and another, I'd rather not choose at all. Geralt of Rivia In autumn of 1272, the imperial advance upon the free city began. From his command center in Vizima Palace, Emperor Amir delegated Morvan Voorhees to command the offensive. 50,000 Nilfgaardian soldiers, accompanied by siege specialists and their war machines, marched north from Velen. Novigrad, however, was not defenseless. Led by Hierarch Hemelfart of the Eternal Flame, the city was defended by an unlikely alliance. On top of the city guard and the church's witch hunters, an influx of Redanian soldiers from Oxenfurt, and also Temerian partisans disillusioned with their leader's submission to Nilfgaard, joined the city's defense. Finally, the surviving leaders of Novigrad's underworld, namely Cleaver the Dorf and Francis Bedlam, the so-called King of Beggars, had brought their hardened gangs out of the shadows. After all, if Novigrad fell, so too would their criminal enterprises. All told, the free city's defenders numbered perhaps 10,000. The Nilfgaardians crossed over the border post bridge in due order, the Redanian garrison there having abandoned their posts after the pro-imperial Temerian agents in their ranks spread dissent about the death of their king. Thus, the morning after the fall equinox, a sea of black banners were visible beyond Novigrad's walls. Hemelfart had not been idle during the approach, having ordered all of the farms and villages outside the city's port side, Tretagor and southern gates, to be leveled to deny the enemy food and cover. The families who lived in these communities, mostly impoverished non-humans, were condemned to starve. Undaunted, Voorhees methodically set up his blockade of the city. The Venendal and Magne divisions were stationed where the village of Aret had once been, and charged with covering the Oxenfurt and Southern Gates. A kilometer south of Portside, the 2nd Vicavaro and Ebbing Brigades were ordered to cover the Portside and Glory Gates. Finally, Voorhees himself set up a command tent in the Seven Cats Inn, from where he personally oversaw the Alba Division's efforts to contain the Tretagor and Hierarch Gates. To complete the encirclement, the Nilfgaardian navy anchored itself outside of Novigrad's harbour mouth, preventing resupply by sea. The free city was cut off from the outside world, and the siege to determine the fate of the north was about to begin. As soon as each imperial cluster's siege engineers had set up their machines of war, the bombardment began. From dawn to dusk, a terrible hail of boulders rained down upon the city walls, and while the city guard attempted to return fire with ballistae mounted on the battlements, their range was not great enough to strike into the imperial clusters, allowing Nilfgaardian trebuchets to pound them with impunity. Present also among the attackers were imperial battle mages, who rained all manner of vicious arcane elements upon the city walls. Novigrad had no answer to this. Any northern wizards who might counteract these spells with their wards had long since escaped to Kovir or been burned by witch hunters. Despite the constant barrage, Novigrad's imposing walls held, cracking but not fully collapsing. Nevertheless, after a week of bombardment, Voorhees concluded that his adversaries had been adequately softened up and ordered a full-scale assault. From their three clusters, the cream of the Nilfgaardian legions attempted to pour over the city's crumbling battlements with siege towers and ladders, but surprisingly the defenders held the line. Even the witch hunters, seasoned in subduing magic users, were able to counteract the influence of imperial battle mages in the assault. By the day's end, the Nilfgaardians had to retreat. The imperial situation worsened when, under the cover of nightfall, a joint coalition of gangsters, led by Cleaver and the King of Beggars, secretly sallied out of the city using a sewer drainage pipe and launched a surprise attack on the Nilfgaardian camps, burning down many imperial war machines before retreating back into the city. This brought the defenders a reprieve from bombardment, giving them enough time for the city's stonemason guild to repair much of the damage done to the walls. It was a temporary victory, one which Hierarch Hemelfart knew only bought his city time, 
for supplies were running out and they were still encircled. In an attempt to break the blockade, the Hierarch ordered the merchant ships in Novograd's harbour to be outfitted with improvised weaponry and attempt to break through the Imperial Navy so as to enable Novograd's resupply by sea. This would not go as planned, for Nilfgaard had assured its fleets were staffed by battle mages, whose terrible columns of fire kept the Nordling carracks in the bay. Incidentally, the Empire took great pains not to burn down the enemy ships, only contain them. After all, Novograd would be worthless to them without the maritime commerce that earned its gold. In the meantime, General Voorhees had begun employing a new tactic. If overland bombardment would not collapse the Goliath that was Novograd's walls, then he would undermine their very foundations. To that end, he employed his best siege engineers to create teams of sappers, which began digging secret tunnels deep beneath the earth in the direction of the city defences. Here, the true relentless efficiency of the Nilfgaardian war machine was shown, as they were under the walls in under a week, having dug their way under the Ponta River estuaries without a single cave-in. On a chilly morning, a month after the solstice, huge bombs detonated under the Tretigor and Hierarch gates, and huge kilometre-long segments of Novograd's walls collapsed entirely. The jugular was exposed, and thus, Voorhees ordered his wayward army clusters to gather upon his centre. The full force of the Nilfgaardian army poured into the city, nearly unopposed, for the defenders had been caught entirely by surprise and could not form proper battle lines before being overwhelmed. What followed was a massacre, with the surviving defenders retreating across St. Gregory's Bridge to mount a final desperate defence on Temple Island. Knowing that Hemelfart could easily collapse the bridge and hole up on Temple Isle for months yet, Voorhees offered the Hierarch relatively lenient terms of surrender to avoid an indefinite standoff. These terms were summarily rejected, for Hemelfart, imbued with religious zeal, was determined to fight to the end. This zealotry, however, was not shared by Novograd's wealthy merchant class, who saw no reason to continue this hopeless struggle when supplication to Nilfgaard seemed far easier and more profitable. So it was that the merchants had their pontiff assassinated and his head delivered to Voorhees, who marched triumphantly into Temple Isle the next morning. Novograd was in Nilfgaardian hands, and with it, the Third Nilfgaardian War was all but over. Delanoy, Florence, linguist and historian, born 1432 in Vicovaro, in the years 1460 to 1475, secretary and librarian to the imperial court. Indefatigable scholar of legends and folk tales, he wrote many treatises on the ancient language and literature of the empire's northern regions. His most important works are Myths and Legends of the Peoples of the North, Fairy Tales and Stories, The Surprise or the Myth of the Elder Blood, a saga about a witcher, and The Witcher and the Witcher Girl, or The Endless Search. Effenberg and Talbot, Encyclopedia Maxima Mundi, Volume 4. After the fall of Novograd, the rest of the North fell within weeks. What was left of Cadwin's leadership defected from their Redanian overlords and submitted to the Empire, while Tretigor, starved of its historically crucial Novograd supply line, surrendered soon after. It had been ten years since a man once known as Dunny ascended the imperial throne, but now the graves of the great northern monarchs joined the barrows upon which the white flame danced. For a time, Amir continued to rule over the continent he had taken three wars and thousands of lives to unify, but soon his reign would end. It is unclear if his death came from natural causes or assassination by his long-standing political opponents, but either way, his successor remained the same. Cyrilla of Sintra, the wayward daughter, for whom Dunny had launched the initial conquest of Sintra so many years ago, had returned. Ciri had been on an adventure of her own this entire time, hopping between worlds while battling spectral riders, all while ever bound by destiny to her fateful white wolf. Now, having fulfilled her role in Ithline's prophecy, she begrudgingly accepted the imperial title, and thus the child of destiny became an empress. In the centuries that followed, a second conjunction of spheres occurred, 
and the Enshe departed through the gates between worlds, leaving behind the human realm that had long caused their suffering, with some saying they joined their long-lost cousins who inhabited an unseely court in a world of fairies and unicorns. Mahakam, meanwhile, had become overgrown and overrun by furry werebugs. Perhaps the dwarves also left the world, or perhaps they simply retreated into the deep tunnels under the mountain, leaving the surface to humanity. Meanwhile, the once proud Nordlings assimilated into provincial life under their imperial masters, and their kingdoms faded into distant memory. But their folk stories, catalogued by imperial scholars, lived on. So it was that Nordling tales, including those of mutant monster hunters, raven-haired sorceresses, and princesses of destiny lingered on in the regions that had birthed them. Thus ends our story of the Nilfgaardian Wars, but we're planning to cover the battles throughout many fantasy universes and sci-fi sagas, so make sure you have subscribed and pressed the bell button. Please consider liking and sharing, as that helps immensely. We'll try to read and respond to every comment, as we want to see what you think about this video and which videos you hope to see in the future. This is the Wizards and Warriors channel, and we'll catch you on the next one.